Hello, and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, a show serving the greater bleeding disorders community, brought to you by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media, and made possible thanks to our presenting sponsor, Takeda. I'm your patient advocate and host, Patrick James Lynch. And I'm your healthcare advocate, nonprofit nerd, and your other host, Amy Board, reminding you to please speak with a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. On today's show, the first of 2024, officially sort of kind of, we did already release one, but we always do that sort of thing. Maya Bloomberg, once again, the Heme NP is back, this time with a recap from the American so- uh, the American Society of Hematology's annual meeting, which closed 2023. We have Janet Brewer of Chess and Ashley Gregory of FAIR with an update on how those two organizations are working together for equity in our community. There is a brand new gene therapy segment yes! that we are unveiling in today's episode. Amy's yes! going to share more about that in just a bit. And there's some big news from the Hemophilia Federation of America that we will discuss right here at the top. We've got all of that, and believe it or not, more on today's episode. (laughs) Welcome to Bloodstream. Listeners, thank you, as always, for joining us today. And if you like what you hear, please share this episode on social media, because that's where to do it. Please, please share that you love and that you listen uh, to the podcast and subscribe to Bloodstream wherever you listen to those podcasts. I was at my hemophilia treatment center yesterday, where there is a new social worker (gasps) who may be listening. Hello, Alejandra, if you are. And she was telling me about how much she appreciates this podcast. She listens to it. She got her dad listening to it who has hemophilia. And she was very, very appreciative of it. She even cited the I'm Fine segment as something that she particularly enjoys. So hey, hey, hey. So thanks for that, Alejandra. Uh, Also, wherever we left off, because I've just distracted myself. But (laughs) listeners, I do want to let you know that this Bloodstream podcast here is made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Takeda. Yes, that's right, Amy Board. Takeda. Takeda believes, get this, in a world free of bleeds. And they are dedicated more than ever in their effort to offer a wide range of programs and support to help patients throughout their treatment journey, wherever on that journey they may be. You can learn more. You really can by simply visiting bleedingdisorders.com. That's all you have to do. Bleedingdisorders.com. And for their founding and ongoing support of the Bloodstream podcast, I would just like to say thanks, Takeda. Thank you, Takeda. Okay, Amy, a uh, lot of things that we mentioned. Hi, mm-hmm. happy 2024. Happy 2024. Here we are. It's good. a whole new year. Did you have a good break? I did have a good break. Great. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> we found out shortly after we came back from break. Uh, we're recording this on uh, January 9th, last yep. time I checked the calendar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and last week, I believe it was on either the 3rd or the 4th. Um, that there was an unexpected meeting held by the Hemophilia Federation of America, after which uh, I believe nine staff members were let go. And as best I know, at least one staff member subsequently resigned following these uh, firings. I'm going to read the statement that came out just yesterday from HFA, Mm. and then we'll chat a little bit. So this is from January 8th. In response to the ever-evolving landscape and the need to adapt to new challenges, the Hemophilia Federation of America Board of Directors and staff are undertaking an organizational restructure. As part of this process, there will be some necessary staff adjustments, including a reduction in force. While these decisions are never easy, they are essential for the long-term sustainability and effectiveness of our organization. Mm. To our former colleagues, we express our deepest thanks and wish them success in their future endeavors. The relationships and bonds formed during their time at HFA will always be cherished, and we are genuinely grateful for the shared journey we undertook to make a difference in our community. Simultaneously, we want to celebrate the resilience and dedication of our current team members who continue to work tirelessly to advance our mission. In the face of change, they have displayed remarkable adaptability and an exceptional commitment to our cause. The strength of our team lies not only in our collective achievements, but also in our ability to come together during challenging times. As we move forward with the restructured organization, we are confident that the passion and expertise of our current team will propel us to new heights and contribute meaningfully to our shared goal of serving our community. Thank you for standing by us as we navigate these changes and work toward a future filled with renewed opportunities and positive impact, co-signed by CEO Dan Kelsey and board chairman Luke Runyon. Uh, Have you read that or heard that before just now? I have not. 
Where was that? Uh, on their website. Oh. As of yesterday and probably out on social as well. Okay. Uh, I'd be curious to hear your first impressions of this news and anything from this statement. Well, I uh, I don't know any of the inner workings. I really don't. Um, I don't have um, a lens or even um, a relationship uh, within that organization in particular to offer any insight. I can say from a nonprofit standpoint that this obviously is... Um, this is a restructuring. They are looking to put uh, new priorities in place. It'll be interesting to see how that trickles down to the community. HFA serves a very specific uh, need and a very specific gap in our community. So I think uh, there are many ears that are going to be perked up at this. I would hope that some of their um, legacy programs don't go away. Um, I do know that the funding landscape is changing in bleeding disorders, and that could have really aligned with this, but um, I feel a little bit in the dark. This kind of stuff always makes everybody feel really nervous. You know, it just makes everybody feel nervous. But um, anyway, th those are my thoughts, I guess. Do you have thoughts? <laughs> Shocker. What Listeners, what if Patrick didn't have thoughts? Let me just go to the next segment. <laughs> All right, Maya Bloomberg. <laughs> Maya Bloomberg, everybody. <laughs> what happened to that? I think it's hard to hear about losing half, more than half, more than half of the workforce, yeah. and not hearing that as a death knell. If I'm being honest, yeah. I just don't know how you reduce that drastically. Yeah. And, you know, I, with respect, I don't know the CEO, Dan Kelsey, from Adam or Eve. I know he comes from outside the community and perhaps that acumen from other organizations not steeped in our history and yeah. ways and means is uh, going to benefit us in the long run. Uh, a lot of affected people were let go. So not only more than half the staff, but a number of people who are themselves community members affected directly by a bleeding disorder. I spoke to a couple of those people. And of course, no one's happy when they're let go from an organization. So yeah. I want to acknowledge that. I also don't want to besmirch the Hemophilia Federation of America or, or anyone for decisions that were made and that were difficult, I'm sure, to make. Yeah. But if I'm being honest, and I don't think there's a point in us doing this program, Amy, if I'm not being honest in moments like this, I just don't know how this isn't the beginning of the end. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the inner workings. I don't know. I do. I, I do want to reiterate that, um, you know, we, we've seen our national organizations make a change in priority. And that means a, a change in like resources, like where they direct resources. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see like where that goes. I'm just so hopeful that uh, some of the legacy programs like Blood Brotherhood and Blood Sisterhood uh, remain. I do share your uh, hopeful your hopefulness that this is the beginning of a great next chapter. Yeah. And I would like to invite, and we can reach out behind the scenes more formally, but I'd love to have members of HFA leadership come on this show in the not too distant future to share the vision. Because like you said, when something like a restructure of this nature happens, it's cause for concern. It raises anxiety. Yeah. Right. So I think it would be of great service to the community to hear some of the leadership voices from HFA during this time. And I'd like to make this platform available for that. So we will hopefully hear more soon. But for now, I think that's the news as okay. it relates to HFA. OK. So with that, Amy Board, let us now elegantly <laughs> transition because uh, science goes on. It science does. goes on. The clock keeps ticking. And uh, there's a brand new segment on gene therapy that we are unveiling today, Amy. So I'd love to give you a chance here to tell us what is this segment about? Why are we doing it? Why, why is this happening? We do episodes of the Global Hemophilia Report. We've done other things on gene therapy. Why are we doing this segment? And then, of course, what can listeners expect to hear from today's first segment? The following segment is intended for informational and educational purposes only and was written and developed by Bloodstream Media. It's a new year, and here at Bloodstream, we love to start the new year with new segments because here's the thing. We love us a good story, and gene therapy is a good story. Full of ups and downs, awesome discord, science, just tons of science, and now a new chapter to the story. 
Gene therapy is now FDA approved for both hemophilia A and hemophilia B. It's widely available. So how come there are still more questions than answers? Gene therapy for all the spotlight remains an intimidating mystery to many. Concerns about reimbursement, intensive long-term follow-up, and a lack of real-world data stop some patients and providers from even considering gene therapy. But the reality is, it's a whole new world for us in the hemophilia community, and an exciting one at that. Gene therapy is a fascinating, provocative science that demands quality information and thoughtful consideration. And here at Bloodstream, that's our jam. So listen in as we hear gene therapy stories from the perspectives of patients, clinicians, and payers. Yes, even payers. Welcome to A Whole New World. This segment is brought to you by CSL Bering, a global biotherapeutics leader focused on serving the rare disease community by providing innovative therapies. They now have a first-of-its-kind treatment for hemophilia B. To learn more about this treatment option, visit beyondhemeb.com and download the B Support app from the App Store or Google Play to stay up to date on relevant information and to manage your treatment journey. Welcome to It's a Whole New World, Demystifying Gene Therapy, one story at a time. I am, of course, Amy Board, and I might be the perfect person to take you through this because, as you know, I am nerdy enough to love this stuff and not smart enough to know nearly as much as I should. So we will learn together. But seriously, the thing I'm most excited about for this segment is the opportunity to hear real-life stories from those who have decided on gene therapy for hemophilia B and those who are considering. So let's begin with a little history. Shall we? Gene therapy is the first medical treatment to address underlying issues within our DNA. Around the 1950s, researchers realized that DNA is the human instruction manual. Your DNA is the most unique and identifying factor about you. It helps determine what color your eyes are, how tall you are, and why your feet just happen to resemble your mother's. My feet just happen to resemble my mother's. Our DNA is organized into small sections called genes. Now, genes are a segment of DNA, and they are involved in carrying information for a particular trait, like your hair color or how tall you are. But genes also help tell your body how to create important proteins. Our proteins serve many functions to keep our body functioning, such as protecting against disease or absorbing nutrients from food or to clot our blood. Now, DNA can get damaged, resulting in changes to its sequence, and these changes are called mutations. DNA is constantly subject to mutations, actually, and this can lead to missing or malformed genes, and that can lead to disease. Gene mutations can range from pretty serious to not so serious. Now, gene therapy involves introducing a functional copy of the protein, such as a clotting factor 9 gene, into the patient's body. This is typically achieved by using a viral vector or a modified virus that acts as the delivery vehicle for the corrected gene. In short, it's seeing if we can use DNA to treat diseases. Science. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Now, it takes about seven to 10 years of study in labs and carefully controlled clinical trials in humans to prove that gene therapy is safe and effective. The first attempts at gene therapy began in 1970. In 1999, the first gene therapy trial for hemophilia B began. This first trial featured intramuscular AAV factor IX injections. Do you want to know what that is? Me too. We're going to find out in this segment. It's going to be great. But by 2007, gene therapy really hit its stride as scientists identified that vectors served as the best vehicle for delivering new genes into cells. These AAV viruses, or vectors, are great at getting into specifically targeted cells, and that makes them ideal for situations where a specific tissue or organ is the cause of the disease. By 2018, a number of late-stage clinical trials were underway for hemophilia B gene therapy. These trials were utilizing AAV-based gene therapy. And of course, in 2022, Hemgenics, a gene therapy for patients with hemophilia B, was approved by the FDA. Cue the confetti. Cue the confetti. Building on more than a century of scientific discovery, gene therapy is now a well-established form of medication with more than 10,000 individuals treated by various gene therapy products. And now, the good stuff. 
Join me all year here on Bloodstream for the latest gene therapy success and setback stories. We've got roundtable discussions featuring patients. Another one will have researchers and physicians. And another one will have advocacy and reimbursement folks. We'll look into the differences between the gene therapies for hemophilia A and hemophilia B. And we'll get a first account interview of the patient and the HTC who dosed the first commercially available gene therapy for hemophilia B. All this and more right here on Bloodstream. So until next time... Stay curious and embrace the possibilities of this whole new world ahead. Once again, this segment has been brought to you by CSL Bearing, which now has a first of its kind hemophilia B treatment. Visit beyondhemeb.com or download B Support wherever you get your apps for more information. Okay, listeners, next we have Janet Brewer, who I don't think we've had on Bloodstream Podcast before. If we have, it's been ages. Ashley Gregory, we had on, I believe, last year to talk a bit about FAIR, still a relatively new organization. Can you tell us, Amy, what are we about to hear? Why did Janet and Ashley come on to talk about chess and FAIR today? Well, I... So and I I tell them this like 14 times in this interview but I so deeply respect the work that both of them do. Do you think they heard it? I don't know. No, they totally heard it. 15 would have no, been the number. No, 15, 15. But I think um these two organizations and these two women in particular have put such a priority on um the issue of women and bleeding disorders that we're really facing today and it is a multi-pronged issue of um believing women what uh the nomenclature should be for women with hemophilia mm-hmm. in particular. And of course, treatment. What does that mean? If women have mild hemophilia, then they should be treated like everyone who has mild hemophilia. And it's a battle. It is a battle between physicians and it is a battle um, for advocates. And so um, Ashley Gregory, of course, um, was a part of the FAIR initiative. And this is a old school grassroots initiative, really, truly, that aims at changing the way we look at women in bleeding disorders and how we treat women in bleeding disorders that has a fair number of um, our older generation really like rising up and like taking the reins of like, you know what? we were a part of change back in the day. We should be a part of change here um, in the future for our sisters, for our sisters in uh, the bleeding disorder community. So Ashley is back to really share how FAIR has gone. It's crushed. I was really excited to hear they're they're really successful and it's wonderful. And they have, I think the thing that both Janet and Ashley mentioned is that this initiative has been um, one of the few, I think, that all of these organizations have really worked together. And that's where Janet really comes in at Chess. Um, her organization very much prioritizes women, um, very much prioritizes is kind of the minority in the bleeding disorders community with Mm. um, families that are dealing with inhibitors, those types of things. So this was right in line. Of course, you all have seen our Shemophilia segments from Chess um, throughout the year. That was a part of some of their work. And so the two of them um, came on to kind of share how they are moving forward here in 2024 in the fight to get equity in women and bleeding disorders. Here, here. All right, let's hear it. Listeners, I am here with Janet Brewer and Ashley Gregory. Ladies, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to speak with you today. And on a personal note, before we even begin, I just want to say um, how deeply I respect uh, the work that both of you are doing in uh, the women's community here in the bleeding disorder community. So thank you for taking your time uh, with us on Bloodstream and to hear a little bit um an update about FAIR and to hear a little update about Shemophilia, which is just both incredible programs. So welcome to the podcast, ladies. Um, Ashley, I'd love to start with you. Um, We had you on Bloodstream last year to introduce FAIR um, to our audience and to our listeners. Give us a quick reminder about what FAIR is all about. And um, here kind of at the start of 2024, what are you all focused on? Yes, thank you so much for having us, Amy. We're thrilled to be here because FAIR is a national grassroots coalition that's dedicated to the diagnosis, care, and treatment for women, girls, and those assigned female at birth with bleeding disorders. As we know, uh, many women are getting care, and we're so grateful for that. However, there are many that are being left behind, and um, with people like Janet and her organization, FAIR is working to eliminate that gap. 
That's incredible, Janet. Um, we heard our segment uh, all throughout last year, Chess's Shemophilia, which I really, really, really loved. Um, but remind listeners, what is Chess? What is the organization? Organization, and how is Chess working with Ashley and with Fair? Thank you, Amy. We were really excited to partner um, with all of you for our Shemophilia in Michigan. It um, it accomplished what we are hoping that it will do is to continue to bring awareness to the fact that women can and do have bleeding disorders. And as Ashley mentioned, we, we definitely, um, we've moved the needle, but we still have a long way to go until all women have the opportunity to be able to be diagnosed as diagnosed, have access to care and treatment. Um, so the Shima Failure Initiative continues. You can find information on our website there um, at chess.foundation slash um, I am really excited to be able to continue to partner with Ashley in the FAIR initiative um, when she suggested it. And uh, shall we probably not two years now, actually? Um, that's the thing possible. Um, as as an or, as chess organiza- as chess as an organization has been working for the last fifteen years um, to um, our goal has not ever as a national organization even though we are a national organization we never um, set out to compete with the national orgs they do a phenomenal job at um, within the areas that um, they they focus on. Um, our goal has always been to support the smaller, more niche areas of the bleeding disorders community, those that are affected by inhibitors. Um, that's been a personal um, mission of both myself and Eric Lowe. Our families are both affected by inhibitors. Um, we also focus on ultra rare bleeding disorders and individuals that have, you know, either an ultra rare factor or an ultra rare plate disorder, such as factor seven or glands and slandestemia. Um, and in 2016, we began Our Ladybugs Initiative as a national initiative um, for all women with bleeding disorders because we know that we're united by that. Um, whether you have a factor disorder, whether you have von Willebrand's, whether you had, you know, um, factor eight, factor nine, factor seven, the list goes on and on in terms of women do indeed bleed and you know what kind of our mission and, and Ashley and I met at a ladybugs event actually it was you know our constant um mantra has been there was always a dirty little secret that women in the community used their son's factor because they had ble- they had menstrual cycles that were just um overwhelming um, and anemia that just didn't stop. And to me, it never made sense that I, if we can treat anemia, then why can't we treat the cause of the anemia, which is the heavy lungs breathing? Not to mention the fact all that we're learning about microbleeds and issues that women have with osteoporosis and, and osteoarthritis and the Shanafe Initiative kind of also brought light to how many women we have that are now managing all of those other issues that perhaps if they'd been treated and they'd been diagnosed correctly, it that wouldn't have happened. So I was really excited to watch like Fair because but the said they have lots of wonderful organizations, lots of wonderful advocates in this community um, that are shouting from the rooftops that women need this support, that women need yeah, that women need sleep and they need to be heard. Well, I'm so silent. Um, and the thing that thrilled me about being able to get involved with FAIR was that there was going to be a collaborative approach um, that we will, as, a, as an advisory committee, that we were bringing people from all of the national orgs, that we had been in positions to make, make advocating for so very long. Dr. Sidonio for years, Dr. Nance for years, who we've been so blessed to work with both of those ladies and physicians, healthcare professionals, we've been such strong advocates for women that are thrilled to be able to join the advisory committee to continue to need that momentum forward so we can use one new voice and not a million voices shouting um, in the wilderness that let's elevate this message. 
Here, here. Janet, crushing. Um, Ashley, back to you. Tell me a little bit about the, a, a big win um, for women with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders since you started FAIR or last year. Um, what are some of the things that you categorize as big wins? There are a few things that we've accomplished. One of them is with the um, communications working group. We have garnered 100 sign-ons for MASAC number 264. What is that? That's the Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee of what used to be National Hemophilia Foundation, which is now National Bleeding Disorders Foundation, and they provide recommendations for treatment. Number 264 is specifically for women with bleeding disorders, and uh, this includes 20 clinicians and even some from very prestigious and well-known institutions. We're extremely excited about that. Another thing that we did was along with uh, Stephen Long and his data and science working group, we created a repository of about 150 articles that people that are seeking a diagnosis can research based on the topic. And that's right there on our website. You go to the top of ftfw.org the tab is research and you can search based on your um, category. It could be pregnancy, um, factor nine, et cetera. So, uh, and so that is very helpful for people who are trying to advocate for themselves while we do our mm. work. Um, one of the biggest wins. Oh. And actually, before you go on, Ashley, I just want to clarify that because and I shouldn't say clarify, but I think just amplify that a little bit is that you have resources for women in the community wanting to advocate for themselves, wanting to come in educated um, with, you know, data behind them to say this, this is the data. This is why I would be interested to be on this treatment plan, as well as your work educating clinicians, you know, the larger medical community, um, that this actually does matter and that women do deserve treatment. And is that, that right? That is exactly correct. And to be fair, one of the ones that we highlight is Chess's repository. That's the first one that's actually on our site. Mm. But if you look below, oh. there are additional 150 additional resources that they can access that yes, to advocate for themselves. Well, we are doing our work to, like you said, educate the providers. And even perhaps, um, well, I wanted to mention one of the really big wins was uh, the, um, the, the compilation of our toolkit. We asked our advisory mm. board and, and specifically Dr. Danielle Nance and Dr. Robert Sidonio, and they put together this toolkit. It's a physical item that you can make notes in and it has prompts for um, things like, well, you know, Janet mentioned using a family member's factor product. Uh, Dr. Nance actually makes the rec recommendation that if you've done so, tell your doctor and tell them what the symptom was and what the results were of the treatment that you provided mm. so that this can be a tool for um, maybe moving your treatment forward a little. Um, so, and this uh, toolkit is in English and Spanish. Um, so mm. I have been sending these out in record numbers. Um, people are requesting them. They're calling me and requesting them to be sent out. It's a PDF on our website. You just go to um, take action at the top and you can click on that. There are so many things. And um, if, if you want to look forward to next year, we can talk about that as well. Uh, or this year. It's now this. It's now next year. Sorry. <laughs> Officially 2024, much to our chagrin. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Um, all of these resources are going to be in the program notes, everybody. So you can um, hop over there to make sure you get these websites and links directly to those resources. Um, actually, it's fantastic. Uh, again, just so excited about y'all's work. Um, Janet, what is Chess doing in 2024 as we're here in 2024 to support he health equity for female bleeders? Um, no, actually, we're really excited because we were just notified in November and can make it official at this stage of the game that um, Chess Foundation was awarded one of the two Sanofi Health Equity Awards that were given out to um, right. bleeding disorders organizations. So we're excited to um, 
also be in the in the company of Julie Fredrickson Jens um, from the Texas chapter. Um, so we will be launching um, kind of to continue on you know what we've been advocating for you know for gosh since 2016 or more um, ab about women and the Ladybugs program and it just has continued to evolve. Um, mm -hmm. So to kind of add on to our Sheen Affiliate Project and our complete advocacy for women with eating disorders, um, one of the things that we have found I um, mean, just speaking with some of the, the women that um, attend our events, whether it be, you know, moms of children with inhibitors or um, individuals that come to our ultra rare programs, um, is that the Hispanic community is especially um, lacking in terms mm -hmm. of information. Um, and many of them will say, well, it's wonderful that you have information on your website in Spanish, but not all of us speak that the same Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um, so we wanted to be able to extend our advocacy, um, and the Sheen Affiliate Project to continue to record these women's stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and as we all know, these stories make such a difference when they come from the mouths of the people who live that way. Um, so we will be seeking women who will tell their stories in Spanish, that we will provide monthly coffee chats for them so that they can share their concerns in terms of what it is that their lives are like and how their quality of life is affected, um, mm -hmm. and how they're able to diagnose, um, uh, how they're able to access um, diagnosis, care, and treatment, um, which is so important to the FAIR initiative. Um, and then we will also provide quarterly, um, quarterly medical conference, um, virtual conferences with them with healthcare professionals that speak Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. One of our, our most exciting events was to be able to provide um, an inhibitor um, family camp event that we do every June um, with our inhibitor families and we had a physician who could answer all of our mom's questions in Spanish mm -hmm. um, and I still can tear up thinking about those moms being able to finally have that question answered and as an inhibitor mom myself your questions are very unique when your child has an inhibitor because it's very such a, a different experience Mm -hmm. um, so for us to be able to um, continue that project under the direction of Paul Wheaton, who was our producer um, for the Sheena Family Project, we're really excited to be able to record their stories, to work with organizations that, you know, currently have large um, populations of women um, that are Hispanic that would like to tell those stories. Um, and to continue to move our message forward, that FAIR continues to move that message forward, that we can change the mm -hmm. paradigm. It's slowly shifting. It mm -hmm. is. It's shifting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's slower than we all want it to be. But I just think that, you know, what we've all seen from those of us that have been working at this at a grassroots level is that change can come when the bottom starts talking to the top and yeah. with the fair initiative putting in place and we also have your your petition as well ashley on our chess website as part of our shima failure initiative is we want organizations we want people to sign that that mesa 260 um let me make certain i get the number right 264 um <laughs> because why do we have, I mean, if we have these recommendations, then the goal is to follow them. I mean, yes. at one point I was a patient member on MASAC years ago when my children were little. And it was important to me as a parent to be able to hear, to have my voice heard. Nobody knows better than a patient what we live with. No one. I mean, our physicians are wonderful, but they don't go home and they're not infusing factor and they're not looking for bleeds and they're not trying to get children on the bus at five o'clock in the morning and get breakfast into everyone while you're managing soccer and baseball and whatever other activities that you're managing. 
Um, so the more we can raise our voices, the more Hispanic women can raise their voices, the more we can all be heard to, to solidify this message that, that women need diagnosis and treatment so that they're not managing long-term health care effects as they age that they, and where they still don't have access to any type of relief. That's that's fantastic. Um, look forward to um, following you this year, uh, Janet, you. with the Chess Organization. Hopefully we can uh, get you back to get a follow-up. Um, to close, again, Janet, Ashley, thank you so much for um, taking time with us, giving us an update. Um, Ashley, I'd love to ask you, um, you mentioned uh, the resources, which is fantastic um, for women who want to advocate for themselves. Um, what can folks do to get involved? Um, anybody, men, women, all the things, how can folks get involved to advocate for this, to be a part of the movement, um, to grow and to even you know, have it trickle down into their own states, their own communities? What can folks do to get involved? Thank you for asking, it's super easy. You can go to ftfw.org and go to um, take action. And there's several options. You can join one of our working groups, and there's several of those. You can ask to just join uh, and support Fair Time and be updated so you'll get emails and such. Um, you can, if you're a member org, ask for materials to uh, share with your community members. We actually have several member orgs already doing this uh, at, the, at, at their, you know, regional and local level. Um, and then uh, if you have some ideas on things that we're not doing, we'd love to hear those too. So there, you are important. Your voice is important. As a matter of fact, your voice is needed and we'd love to hear what you have to say. So come join us. Be a part of Fair Time for Women, which includes all genders and uh, thank you, Amy, so much for this opportunity. Absolutely. Ashley, thank you. Janet, thank you. Thank you for being with us and uh, respect your work deeply. And we hope to amplify it to the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Amy. Yeah. Maya, you're next. Maya Bloomberg, the Hema NP, our final segment for today, gives us a recap of the American Society of Hematology's 2023 annual meeting from her perspective. Take it away, Maya. There was a lot of exciting research at the 65th Annual American Society of Hematology Conference, and I'm going to do my best to highlight the most relevant data as it relates to classical hematology. Now, for those who don't know, classical hematology is the newest term to refer to patients who care for non-malignant or non-cancerous blood conditions like bleeding disorder, sickle cell, and clotting disorders, to name a few. ASH conference kicked off with the FDA approving not one, but two gene therapies for sickle cell, and the conference showcased some never before seen data on efficacy or just making sure product does what it's intended to do, safety, and longer term data. Vertex's exocell uses CRISPR-Cas9 technology to genetically modify an individual's own cells at a point on the beta globin chain that would lead to somebody producing fetal hemoglobin, which is much more stable than cyclic hemoglobin since it binds to oxygen more strongly, and this is why it's the primary hemoglobin produced in the womb to make sure the baby's getting all the nutrients. Bluebird Bio's Lova cell gene therapy uses a lentiviral vector, basically an inactivated virus that serves as an envelope to hold the genetically modified material, which then inserts itself into the stem cells, ultimately leading to the production of normal, healthy hemoglobin A. Both gene therapies convert someone essentially from having sickle cell disease to sickle cell trait, thus reducing pain and the need for blood transfusions, reducing complications, and all of which should improve life expectancy. Now switching gears to hemophilia gene therapy, if you weren't aware, we have two FDA approved gene therapies, one for hemophilia A and one for hemophilia B. CSL came out with HemeGenex for hemophilia B and Biomarin came out with Roctavian for hemophilia A. Now in hemophilia gene therapy, an inactivated viral vector functions as that envelope to contain genetic material that then travels to the hepatocytes or the liver cells where factor eight or factor nine are produced. A single infusion essentially will aim to convert a person from severe hemophilia to mild severity with most discontinuing the need for prophylaxis. While we see a quick rise in factor levels well within the normal range after receiving gene therapy, we see that levels begin to decrease after the first couple of years to a threshold that many would still need factor for surgery or major traumas and some might need to be restarted on prophylaxis. 
There are some unknowns that remain, such as factor expression or how long factor is going to be produced or maintained for. And it seems like factor 9 and hemophilia B may have a little bit longer expression when compared to hemophilia A, likely because the molecule is so much smaller that it was easier to genetically modify compared to that large factor 8 molecule. I did see an interesting poster evaluating a non-viral vector that could offer a potential for redosing somebody after receiving gene therapy because right now how it stands, you can only get one shot. No pun intended at all on that one. Because once you're exposed to that viral vector, such as the adenovirus, your body starts creating antibodies against it. So fast forward, if you were to receive another adenovirus vector infusion, it'll be unsuccessful because your body is going to have antibodies that will then break down the vector on the next time it's going to be exposed. There were slides of gene therapy in people co-infected with uh, well-controlled HIV and hepatitis B or C, so they really are turning many stones to evaluate the safety to make sure people can benefit from this therapy while posing minimal harm. There were also a lot of posters on novel therapies in the pipeline for the treatment of both hemophilia A and B with and without inhibitors, with many starting to be approved sometime this year. These treatments focusing on rebalancing that coagulation seesaw by either adding procoagulants or things that enhance the clotting process or by removing anticoagulants or things that oppose clot formation and lead to bleeding. These novel therapies are given subcutaneously or underneath the skin similar to insulin or emicizumab and they'll be indicated for prophylaxis, which means that you still will need a second product for any bleeding issues or for surgery management. Data of these therapies showed a clinical benefit in preventing and reducing bleeding episodes, including the tissue factor pathway inhibitors such as concizumab and marstacanab, as well as serpent PC, which reduces the activated protein C, which is necessary to break down thrombin. And as a reminder, hemophilia is caused by a deficiency in thrombin. There were also a lot of posters on health equity and psychosocial support. And if anybody knows me, this is literally my favorite topic. Data confirms that people with hemophilia at sickle cell as well are at increased risk for depression, anxiety, and even ADHD when compared to the general population. This really does highlight the importance of teaching coping mechanisms, getting connected with support groups, and just overall stresses the importance of being seen at a hemophilia treatment center to receive that comprehensive care so we address both your medical and psychosocial needs. Our females also had a presence at ASH with multiple posters, including one that evaluated whether or not female carriers have higher risk for joint disease based on musculoskeletal ultrasound. That one was out of Miami. Woo. And there was also some highlighting those diagnostic delays that negatively impact health among our female carriers. I honestly could go in for hours. This was hands down the largest conference I've ever been to with over 37,000 people. And I am still sorting through all of the abstracts and content I still haven't been able to make it through. Uh, but I hope that this was an enjoyable highlight and you learned something new. Thank you, Maya, once again, and as always. And thanks again to Ashley, to Janet, to Amy. Who else did we hear from today, Amy? HFA. HFA. Let's see. Thank you, Keith, for producing this episode. Thank you to... Uh, the people that cleaned the office over the weekend. That was nice. That's super nice. Thank you to Alex for editing. Thank you to Alex for editing. And Japneet for doing some of the uh, social work. Yeah. And if we didn't mention you, it's because we we don't really think it's worthy. Um, <laughs> I am kidding. I also want to say thank you to our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Visit bleedingdisorders.com to learn more. And our segment sponsor, CSL Bearing, for their support of our new gene therapy segment. Amy Board, Bloodstream Podcast is back again Friday, January 26th. What can listeners expect to hear on that episode? We have a fantastic interview with none other than Dana Kuhn and mm -hmm. Kathy McKay, who are instrumental in our history um, in the tainted blood scandal, of course. Their advocacy work has been um, noted as legendary. And mm -hmm. they are back with um, some new initiatives um, to make sure that that, is, that time is archived in terms of documents. So it's a fantastic conversation. And I always love talking to Dana and meeting Kathy, who is a longtime listener. Um, Thank and you, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be great. Please stick around for that. And we've got a couple segments, too. The I'm Fine segment's going to be back, and Elite Athletes will be back as well. Bloodstream starting the year strong. Well, with that, that is all for this episode. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. 
to Bloodstream Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts to have that next episode delivered to you the moment it goes live. Hey, loyal listeners, as always, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. What a, that what a great is email address. The email address that you can use to inquire about Bloodstream Media and our casting opportunities. Also, mm. you can find us on social media. PJL and I are on all the social media. Bloodstream Media is also there as well. So you can hit us up, ping us. If you have any topics or if you have something that you would like to discuss, I will say that loyal listener Kathy McKay actually reached out to us like hey we're doing this thing I'd love to talk about it that is great so please let us know if you're doing an initiative in the community we like to hear local things local stories local struggles so please reach out at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or you can find us on social well said I am your host Patrick James Lynch and I am your other host Amy Board and until next time take self-care of yourself bye everybody bye bye